So there's an intersection between RBA members and our health customers. You know a whole lot of them. You know all the RBA people, and you know all the bird people. It's on.
this is my 36th, 37th year of doing these types of presentations for the books that I write. I have spoke at every type of venue you can possibly imagine. Um, every denomination of church, every, yeah, I mean, outdoors, indoors, but this is a first. <laughs> <laughs> and my mind just reels looking at this, thinking, all right, if you guys are showing, if this many people show up from where I'm alive, I know nobody would show up if I was dead. <laughs> so, I want to thank you for coming today. My name is Stan Tequila, and I'm an author and a naturalist, um, wildlife photographer. Who knows what a naturalist is? I bet you think you know what it is, but do you really know what it is? Anybody? No? Didn't think so. A naturalist is an educator. An educator about nature. It may be about plants, and animals, birds, insects, whatever it may be. And um, you do this through a variety of different ways. At least I do it through a variety of different ways. Um, I, write a, um, I write a syndicated newspaper column. Uh, anybody here know Outdoor News New York? Anybody? There. I've been writing for them for almost 25 years. One person, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I have a uh, syndicated radio show that goes through the Midwest. I live in Minnesota, so it goes through the Midwest um, on a bunch of different uh, stations there. I'll be on tomorrow morning. Um, and that's another way. It, it's great because I'm on this hunting and fishing show, and I don't hunt for fish. And so I just poke fun at these guys who, who hunt and fish who think that they know something about nature, and I had a lot of fun with that. Um, yes, go ahead. My husband watches you. Ah, good. Yes. On, yes. on KFAN? Yes. Wow, how about that? Yeah, K-F-A-N, KFAN, and it's Fan Outdoors, and you can tune in tomorrow morning if you want, or, or not. They podcast it, too. Um, and I write books, so uh, believe it or not, as a kid, I, I wanted to write nature books. I thought... What a cool thing, you know? And um, about 35 plus years ago, I met a couple who was starting a brand new publishing company called Adventure Publications. They took a chance on me, took me on as one of their very first authors, and I got to realize my lifelong dream of writing a nature book. Now keep in mind, this, that's pre-computer, so all my first four or five books I did were all on a typewriter. And, I got to realize my lifelong dream of writing a nature book, and then at the end of that, nobody said stop, so I just kept going. And here we are, I'm still doing it, the same publisher all these years. Too. But it's been great, really it has been. Um, I was, past tense, the director of the Starring Lake Nature Center in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. I was there for 35 years, and I just retired in January. So that's been a, that's another way of educating we, we did everything from preschoolers on up to seniors, so uh, constantly teaching about different things. And um, what else? And I'm a wildlife photographer. And uh, is anybody else exhausted <laughs> listening to that? <laughs> I'm tired. Yeah. All right. So with that, should we get started? That's me. Questions before we get started? No. I'm not surprised. People must have no right to come and see me. So And so that's one of the other things 
that I believe really kind of brings these owls kind of closer to us. They have eyes in the front of their heads. What a weird thing to say, Stan. <laughs> but we're going to talk about that just a little bit. This is why I brought that up. And the top trailer is like wolves. I like that. I think that's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool thing to have, too. So, pretty dishes. I'm just, again, moving around. I have a bottle on here, but I don't think we have a speaker, do we? Yes, there is. All right. Uh, so these owls are members of the Stridgeon form, and I cannot think of a more boring topic, so let's just move on. Let's <laughs> get into something more fun. So owls are found around the world. Okay, they found on all of the uh, continents except for Antarctica, which makes sense, right? Um, over 250, actually 254 exactly, four models. That's less than 3% of the birds in the world. So it's a very small subset of a subset. You know, you've got your raptors and then you've got the owls. This is a really small thing. So, you know, because people are really, they really like owls, you know? And there's, I mean, you guys must have around here in Rochester, right? You have the owl paparazzi, you know, that group of people who are on the campus that call the of the owls and things like that. What is that? I mean, it's really because it's everywhere. It's a human nature. Uh, 19 species of owls found here in the United States. I'm going to adjust that just a little bit here. There we go. 19 species found in the United States and Canada. Um, it's a diverse group here. Uh, they range in size from the elk owl, that's this guy here, up to the snowy owl. That's our kind of, it's not our tall snow, but the snow is our largest, kind of most powerful of our owls, too. Elk owl weighing only one and a half ounces. Ooh, what a killer. <laughs> One and a half ounce bird. Holy mackerel. Talk about an attitude. So, the great gray owls run about, uh, they're pretty big, about two and a half pounds, 27 inch wingspan. 27 inches. That's not that big. They don't know if it's too deep. So, the snowy owl kind of comes in with four pounds uh, with a 50 to 60 inch wingspan. Now, let's put that in perspective. The snowy owl being the most powerful owl. Um, any idea how much? Let's just say a bald eagle weighs. Anybody have a guess? Wow. Hello. 35? Imagine 35 pounds. 15 pounds. About 8 to 10. Uh, females are bigger than males, and, and females get up to 12 pounds. So, you know, I love that. People are always like, this one was particularly huge bird. They're not like people. Uh, they have limits to their sizes. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be able to fly. So if a, if a big ball equals 12 pounds, these guys are four. So you always are four. So they're, they're really not that big overall. They're like mostly that is, is the point again. So uh, by the way, at the, uh, I think we can say they're mostly feathered. So at my nature center, we have a, a barred owl for an education 
very short lifespan. And as the birds get bigger, they move into chickadees, so they're in the five year range, uh, they'll go upwards of nine, they'll, uh, you get into bigger birds like sparrows, you get into six years, bigger birds up into like blue jays and crows, you get up into 10, 12, into the hawks, and you got 20, and then what's our biggest bird? In, in, what's the biggest bird in North America? Condor, California condor, right? California condor is our biggest bird. How long is that one? 50. And 50, 50, did I hear anybody else? 16, what are 16? Oh, here I had something. <laughs> Eight years of those guys. Oh, wow. So you've got this nice, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's like from the smallest to the biggest, you got that, that age gradient. And these owls, depending on what size owl they are, they can live a different lifespan. So the larger the bird, the longer they live, okay? Small owls, 10 to 12 years, the larger owls, about 20 to 25. That's a general broad, you know, generalization about it too. But it's almost always things like people that kind of get in the way of all these kinds of things. The most dangerous time of life uh, for an owl is the first year of life. About 50% of the owls that are hatched every year don't make it to uh, your, you know, their first birthday. They don't make it at all. So it's not, I mean, which is not bad. Woodpeckers, 60, 70 percent of them make it. And the smaller birds, only 40 or so percent make it. So 50 percent is about average for these types of birds. So many hazards, such as cars, trucks, illegal trapping, of course, shooting, starvation, predators, other predators. Oh my gosh, that is a problem. Other predators are a real problem. Uh, you know, of course, I help ban owls in our area, and we're doing the saw webs. You guys do the saw web banning around yeah. here too? Yeah. And so there's. You know, you know, one night we take the solid all and we bathe it, and then of course, um, uh, after we put it over on a stump, it darkens, we walk away, of course, a barn owl that comes out of the dark and mm -hmm. grabs the wool and saw it, and off it goes, and it's like, you know, it is definitely an owl eating owl world out there, so, or a birdie bird world would be a better way to put it. So, owls are very unique in their design, in their shapes, and how they are, um, and they, they have the appearance of being. And smart. Uh, they have these large round heads. Think about that. You know, you're talking about like say a, a robin, right? It's got big, big shoulders to a small head. You know, in the middle like that. Even a, you know, anything like that. An eagle uh, can have a small head in comparison to its wide shoulders. But with the owls, their shoulders about as width as their head. So it's got that, that look that's different from other birds. That makes sense there. Uh, and so it's large in proportion to their bodies. They have human-like eyelids that come from the top down. And they have large forward-facing eyes. There I go again. What's up with these eye placement? Who cares, right? Well, you got to look at these birds to determine who they are. Eye placement is extremely important. Because eyes are how they find the prey, how, they, how any bird will live. And so let me just get this out of the way right now. When, when a robin runs across your front lawn and stops and cocks its head, what is it doing? It is not listening for worms. It's, <laughs> its eyes are on the sides of its head. It's looking out one eye or it's looking out the other eye. You gotta ask yourself, when was the last time you heard a worm. You know, you know, you're laying in bed at night, you got the window cracked, it's such a beautiful evening, and you're, I mean, oh, if I could just, if those worms would just shut up out there, I'd be so sick. So, its eye placement is extremely important for these, uh, for all of these birds, and where they are at, too. And by the way, let's get back to this the appearance of being alert and smart. So, um, you can't give an IQ test to a bird. I mean, that'd be great if you could, you know. Or it'd even be better if you could just interview them and just sit down and say, all right, I got to know this stuff. Tell me, you know. And um, so what they do is they'll take, obviously, dead birds, and they'll measure the brain and, compa and compare it to the overall weight of the body of the bird. So this brain-body ratio is trying to give them an idea of the intelligence of these birds. And 
it's not really a good <laughs> way of doing it because it works fine for a lot of birds, but when you hit like the crows, they got really small brains, but they are crazy smart, right? So, but they use it as a general guideline. When you do that with owls, their intelligence comes in at about middle to low middle, so slightly below average in intelligence. Now, if you ask my raptor handlers <laughs> at my nature center who work with our barred owl every single day, they would say that that bird is not very smart, you know, because it, or it's more stubborn than you can possibly imagine. Um, so owls, although they look smart and everybody thinks that they're smart, wise old owl and things like that, they really come in on that average to slightly below average in, in intelligence, as far as we can tell. Because, you know, here's the thing. All the things I've been teaching and doing all this stuff for 40 years, and all those things that we used to kind of rely on as facts are now turning out to be maybe not so true. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a little bit. So, they have a very, going back to this unique design, uh, when you look at these, uh, at these birds, they have this sclerotic ring, this ring that goes around their eyes, made up of anywhere from 11 to 14 uh, bones, kind of fused together, and it goes around their eye. Very interesting, by the way, you don't have that, I don't have that, it's not a mammalian trait. What other animals have that? Anybody know? Lizards. I'm sorry? Lizards. Lizard reptiles. Reptiles. Yeah. The reptiles all have that same that same sclerotic ring, it's called. It's pretty yeah. unusual stuff here. So let's take a look at it. Here's a northern saw owl. Um, we're looking at the other unique features of them. They're the feathers on the face. Uh, they say act to bring in sound to their ears. I don't see their ears. <laughs> You? Where are those ears, by the way? Well, here you can see them on the skull. Here's one there, and there's one there. And in the owls that are mainly nocturnal, like for example, snowy owls are not mainly nocturnal. Okay? They live in the Arctic. It's 22 hours of daylight. Okay? So they're not mainly uh, These guys are mainly uh, are out at night, and you can see the offset in their ears there. One's high, one's low, one's big, one's small, and they use this to help triangulate in the sound that's coming to their face. So it's an interesting thing. Uh, also, can you imagine if you had two different shaped and placed ears if you were a kid? Well, you imagine you could be at school and something. So, uh, and these, these on here is large and obvious in some and not so much in, it, in others too. So. And this, this is called asymmetrical openings for their ears here. You can see the facial discs. There's the ear and there's the other ear. You see how remarkably different they are? But when you look at the skull of those daytime uh, owls, they, they don't have this asymmetry as much as that. So I see a lot of people make that blanket statement, all owls have, you know, unequal ears. Not true. It just isn't. Uh, I like the way they blend in, too, like this. They have a nice barrel-shaped body. I think that's great. And they have that barrel-shaped body to uh, have a lot of flight muscles. These flight muscles, these pectoral muscles, is what propels them in, uh, in these strong, short, powerful flights that they do, like that. They have camouflage colors. And it's mainly to kind of hide during the daytime. So that when they're trying to sleep, and we're going to talk a little bit about that too, a little bit here. When they're trying to sleep, they're not being bothered by other birds. Too. So they blend into the environment during the daytime, and that's very, very helpful. I mean, if you hunt at night, do you need camouflage? No. Of course you don't, right? So they have very unique feet and toes, okay? So they have toes and talons. You can see the toes are this part in here all the way up to there. This is still part of the toes, and the talon is the nail at the end right down here. So they use these to capture and hold prey. Um, it's usually not how they kill. How they kill is usually with a bite to the spine of the you know small mammal that they, that they caught. And the whole idea behind this is that they can capture this thing and keep it away from their eyes 
while they're manipulating it and holding it in place. Because if they got it up to their face, while, you know, it was, you know, kind of flailing about, it could injure their eyes, which would spell death for the, for the zombies they wouldn't be able to, to see. So it reduces the eye injury, and it usually, and they use these feet to hold them very securely. So eyesight is very important in these things. So they use their screech owl, uh, its eyes, just its eyes, weigh about a quarter of an ounce, or 5% of the entire body weight of the herd. 5% of the body weight, overall body weight, that's a lot. That should show you how much importance is being placed on those, uh, those eyes in there. A human eyeball only weighs about one ounce, and it's really a minuscule fraction of our overall body weight. So just by comparison there, too. So. And then size is in proportion to the body. So they have these huge eyes that if we had eyes in the same proportion, so it's eyes in proportion to their head, if we had eyes in the same proportion to uh, our heads as they did, we have these massive eyes. You know. Some people say it'd be as large as tennis balls, and you know, but let's just say that it could be something quite large that we would have if we had eyes like owl eyes in proportion to our heads. So owl eyes are very different from our eyes. So right away, what we do as people, what we do all the time, is we like to project our um, our human experience, the things that we've experienced, the things that we've uh, experienced in the world, the things we've seen, the things we smell, the things we touch, the things we taste, and all like that, and we try to project that onto the, onto the birds, and, and you're almost always going to be wrong because so many things are different. For example, our eyes shape our eyes, we call them eyeballs, right? And the reason why we call them is because they're round, they roll, okay? These guys don't, they have tubular shaped eyes much longer than, than what they have. And that increases the focal length. And like a photographer with a long lens, the longer the lens, the more magnification you have. And that's why these guys have that. The consequences of that is that the eyes are fixed in their head. They can't do like you and I do. We look right, we look left, we look up, we look down, we look all around with our eyes, but and not move their head. They can't. Make sense? Because these things are really fixed in their head. So here's a, a good example of Greek Hornado. There's an Escalada Green in their eyes about here. 10 to 18 bones on there. Um, and, and why would you have bones around your eye? Because it, it doesn't seem like that. What does that say? Protection? Anybody else? No, bones are almost there always for muscle attachment. So there's muscles that attach here. Need something solid. The muscles need something solid to anchor to. Because on the back of the eye, in that tubular eye, those muscles pull out of the eye and it pulls it forward and pulls it back. And those strong muscles help to move that eye in and out to change the focal length from the lens in the front to the retina in the back of the eye. And that is how we're able to, it's called accommodate, the accommodate of things. I can look at you and see very clearly that the far and also see very clearly. But these guys can do that in faster time than you and I can do. So, so they have more muscle attached for faster focusing. And that whole thing is something. And I can spend a whole night just talking about eyes in birds because they're so different. In fact, I just came up with a new talk that's called Shockingly Why We Are Not Like a Bird. Because, and it looks at all the different parts of us in comparison to birds and how different we are. Some of the things that they do is they, they have faster focusing than we do. And here's a good example of it. Have you ever wondered why or how a bird can fly through those woods and not hit a branch? Think about it. That's pretty amazing stuff. Now do it at night. If you don't think this is amazing, after this, we're all going to line up out there in the blue line. I want you to start running. <laughs> get around all of those things. It's, it's truly amazing what they do it. And they do that by accommodating the focus much faster than you and I. In addition to that, these birds, their optic nerve is so much larger than ours. It has a shorter pathway to the brain than ours. And they acquire images so much faster. We accommodate it about 50 times a second, 30 to 50 times. 
times the second we occur, we like take in a picture, and that's how we put it all together in a movie-like sequence in our, in our brains. These guys are much faster than that. They're in the 120 to 130 range. Yeah, so if anybody here shot video, if you're, if you're shooting at 120 frames per second, 120 individual pictures per second, it's slow motion. So it must be something very different for them when they're flying through these, you know, obstacle courses, basically. So they have much better low light vision than we do. Their light sensitivity irises can shrink and expand much more than ours do. Uh, the dilatation, which is, you know, how much opens to bring in more light, is bigger than ours, allowing two and a half times more better vision in low light. Because they're not, I mean, it's never pitch black, it's never no light. So they only need to see in low light like uh, that. Compared to non-predator birds, they have over 100 times more low light sensitivity than other uh, birds like that. So there's something going on there too, some really interesting things going on. Three points, does anybody can get this identification of this bird? Okay, five points. How long? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, 
they have very many uh, bills that are oftentimes pointed downwards, like hawks and eagles are upward in their bills, and columns have bills that are going down. And they have these bristles in here. Uh, they look and act like hairs. They are not hairs. They are feathers. And they're called a bristle feather. And uh, that, they act like a hair. Uh, like a, a hair. So shorter than the sloping, specialized feathers. And they kill by biting. So they'll hold their prey up, subdue it, and then they'll reach down and give a bite to the back of the neck, seven the spinal column on the small mammal, and then oftentimes that's just enough to do it. They oftentimes will swallow their prey whole, unlike hawks and eagles that tear up their prey. Now, owls do tear up their prey to feed their babies, but they oftentimes will just swallow their prey whole. So uh, they have smaller, less powerful bills. So we did something, we always did something called you know, enrichment for our owl at the nature center. We had a barn owl and a gray owl. He, he unfortunately passed last October. But um, this owl was absolutely amazing. We've got this, this bill here. We were putting in different enrichment things. And the first time we came in with a uh, half a head of iceberg lettuce. Just took a head of lettuce and cut it in half, brought in that head of lettuce and set it in the middle of the list, thing and just left it there. Then went home for the night, came back the next day, had a perfect pile of shredded lettuce. <laughs> so much so, I thought the stack was many a joke. Because <laughs> it was right in the perfect pile, it was all shredded perfectly. This whole lettuce, and the bills, they, they can work it to the point where they can cut things with it too. And so it's very, so once we discovered that, then like once a week, we bring them less and you just chop them up. You know, all night long as a, a form of enrichment. So it's absolutely amazing things that they do. Horns and ears, ear cuffs at these hours. What's up with these ear cuffs? How are you to evoke from there? Huh? So um, we call them ears, of course, uh, from what we just learned. Darkness. 
by the time they got down to where the ear openings were and they were removing feathers near the ear openings, the bird couldn't really catch the mouse anymore. This is very interesting stuff because if you ask me, the more stuff I have around my ears, the less I hear. You know? So why is it with these guys with these feathers packed in around the ears that they can hear so well, but when you remove it, it's just the opposite, right, of what you would think. And they all of a sudden can't. Uh, so. so their hearing must be completely different uh, than what we expect them to have, right? So here's that split second tiny. Here you can see, here's a great gray owl. Ear there and the ear there. See, great great gray owls also hunt during the daytime, too. They're not strictly nocturnal. So uh, that's not a good example there. But uh, the barn owl here, uh, high here and relatively. Many animals have this asymmetrical ear uh, opening. So, so where's the sound? We talked about this. Uh, we talked about that. All right. They have ear flaps called an operculum that they can control with muscles to cover their ears during the daytime. Because think about it. If you're an owl, you've been out all night, and you're dog tired, and you've been hunting mice, and you need to sleep during the daytime, you think you want to be listening to all the damn robins? So they have a curriculum that they can cover the ear with to cut down the, the amount of uh, external sound that's coming in. Shouldn't that give you a little bit of a pause to think the next time you see an owl and people are hushing you, shh, 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 <laughs> that maybe you're being too loud for the owl? You think if you were being too loud for the owl, they would just close their own curriculum. They don't, you know, this isn't anything really uh, new for them. They need to have that. So some interesting things there. So they have ear flaps so that they can sleep during the daytime, especially when the crows come around the bottom, too. So covered by dense and packed feathers, and they close their ear flaps to sleep, too. So we talked about the facial discs, focusing sounds. What's this about? This feather, we talked about that, 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 that. Okay, we talked about all that. Facial expressions, I love that. Where you, they kind of look different ways at you. You know, they're going to give you like a little sting eye and they kind of, you know, different things like that. They adjust their feathers on their face to help adjust their hearing also. And they can control the size and shape of the feathers around their face like that. So, fur and the owl, aren't they cute? Tiny little things. You know? So, owl size. So, let's talk about this for a minute. Uh, the size of the owl correlates to wherever it is that they eat. So this is an elf owl. That's a June bug. Yeah, these are tiny little owls with the size of sparrows. Little tiny things here. Has anybody ever seen this go to Arizona in the summertime? You can see these guys. They're, they're hysterical because they're in woodpecker holes that are this big around. So uh, smaller owls need to spend more time hunting than the larger owls. So they require 50% of the body weight to prey the small owls do. Larger owls only need about 15% of their weight in prey every day. So the bigger owls don't need to be as active. They don't need to be hunting as much and as often as the little guys do. Uh, sizes and latitude. Larger owls in the more northern latitude, while some of the southern owls, the smaller owls in the southern latitude. You guys, you know about the Bergman's rule? All right. It's a biological rule that says within a species, Within the species, let's just, just for simplicity's sake, let's use white-tailed deer as an example. White-tailed deer in the northern states, I live in Minnesota, our deer are 200 plus pounds. Okay? And as you move further south, those deer get smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay? That's because um, the larger you are, the easier it is for you to stay warm okay, in cold temperatures. The smaller you are, the easier it is for you to shed heat and stay cool. So, white tail here in Minnesota, about 200 pounds, and then you move further south, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. By the time you're in Florida, they're in that 60 to 80 pound range. By the time you get out under the Keys, you have a key deer, which is a white tail here, and they are 40 pounds under the this big. They're below my knees. And this is the Bergman's rule. The further north you are, the bigger you are, the further south you are, the 
giving you a little hard time about your weight, try to remind them that we live in northern states. We need that extra weight. See if it works, get back to me. I don't give it really give it time. So anyway. Uh, sexual dimorphism. Ooh, that sounds like a naughty word, doesn't it? <laughs> sexual dimorphism, what is it? The male is different from the female. Yeah, uh, the sexual dimorphism means uh, two different sizes, and the owls, the females, are bigger than the males. All right, so what do we got here? Which one's male, which one's female? Yeah. Yeah, it, not only is she bigger, but look at that glare he's getting. Come on, guys, you know what I'm talking about right here. So the females We've always thought, and it's always been taught, that um, through evolution, uh, the females became larger. They evolved to be larger over time because they are the ones producing the eggs. Then they have to have that body mass in which to produce the heat, right, to warm those eggs. And so we always thought that the females evolved to be bigger. The current theory now is that it's actually the males have probably evolved to be small because they are uh, doing more hunting, they're bringing in the food, and they need to be more agile. That's the current thoughts on it, too. Will we ever know? No. <laughs> but it's what they think later. So, females lose lots of weight when they're incubating their eggs and brooding their chicks. So, this is a, it's a fact that happens with them. It's a partial starvation that they do in order to. Now, you moms know what I'm talking about, right? The things you wouldn't do. These birds have silent flight, which is fascinating because everybody always thinks, well, they have silent flight because they need to sneak up on their prey, when in fact that's probably not the case. Uh, it's believed that the silent flight is probably more for themselves. Think about it. You're an owl. You're on a branch. You're in the woods. You hear a mouse down there. That's like, okay, figuring out where it's at, getting that horizontal, getting that vertical, you're figuring out right where they're at, and if you didn't have silent flight, you would jump off that branch and it would be just like, <laughs> and where did it go? You know? So it's believed that the silent flight is not to sneak up on its prey. Its prey doesn't know it's coming anyhow. It's dark out, right? It's so that they can maintain the hearing all the way into their target so they can capture the prey at the last second. And if you think about it, that makes a whole lot more sense than to sneak up on their prey. So because mice are down underneath the leaves and they're doing mouse things, and it's something coming from above. They're not thinking about it at all. So I think this picture of my backyard by the way. Owls are very camouflaged too, like that. They're equipped to conceal. So matching the bark, again, with big tufts. This position of concealment helps them to blend in uh, all that. So they have this disrupt, disruptive uh, design with uh, dark and light color shading back and forth with it, too. So, and here they are, like, striking the pose. You can see they sit with their ear tufts up so that they can blend into other things around them. So, we got that. Worldwide, about 40% of all the owl species have ear tufts. That's about uh, one third of our 19 species. So you got to think of it this way: if if they didn't do something beneficial to them, they would have evolved out of those ear tufts a long time ago. So it must help them in some possible way, most likely a position of concealment. So the color collections. Um, so we talked about the Bergman's rule, you know, the weight. Now there's the Glauber's rule. These are all biological things. Any biology biologist here, you probably know all of this. Here, the Glauber's rule is the drier the habitat, the grayer the bird, and the moisture in the habitat, the kind of redder the bird is. So when you look at these speech owls uh, in uh, Texas, uh, you get 70% uh, are red in Florida, but only about 7% are red in Texas. Make sense? So and this helps them to blend into their environments around them. So their feet and their talons, by the way, that's what you don't want to see if you're a mom um, on these birds coming in. And they come in, and these are really good uh, uh, killers, what they are. So the pals, they have spicules on the bottoms of their toes underneath here to help hold on to those slippery little uh, mice and moles and things like that. Uh, the birds that are in the further north have feathers all the way down to the ends of their toes. So the only thing that's showing is the nail, is the talon. So 
the answer is because they don't. That's their angle. Once again, if you try to put our human values on these things, we kind of get it wrong. But me is up in here. This is its angles. You and I, we are planted ready. We walk around flat footed, not very efficient. These birds are digitigrade. They walk around on their toes like this. And this here is this part of their foot from their toes to their ankle. Those are the tarsal bones. So, in fact, their, their, their knees don't bend backwards. Make sense there? So, what's to eat? I love this. Rabbit for the look at this. Oh, it's all in all a monster mouse. Close as big as he is. Where's he gonna fit all of that? It doesn't make any sense here. So the diet uh, varies for each day, depends on what they catch. Right? I love that. People make those blanket statements up by us like great great owls only eat bowls. <laughs> you imagine? Great great owls sitting on a branch. Ooh, I guess Ooh. I'm hungry. Uh, Dad needs a mouse. <laughs> I don't think it falls. Come on. I love that when people make these declarative sentences like that. Well, they only eat wolves. People, well, sure, they eat a lot of milk, but they also eat anything else that can be small enough for them to catch. And there's proof right there. Catching a mouse. So, screech owls. And, you know, screech owls will eat small birds and small mammals, too. Very hard owls will take just about anything. This is a boreal owl, by the way. So, so hunting instinct. Moving, they're not going to go after dead roadkill or things like that. So a diminished sense of smell. So for 40 years I've been teaching that birds have a very reduced ability to smell. Guess what? The latest studies that are coming out right now are showing that birds actually have a very good sense of smell. Ugh. It's exhausting, you know. But it's happening, and they've done some really nice studies with this. And I predict over the next 10 to 20 years we're going to learn. have weak acid in their stomach here. Hawks are six times more. And so because of that, these birds don't really, are, aren't able to digest the bones and the fur. And so what they do is they'll eat a whole uh, bowl or a mouse like that and then they'll pop off a pellet about six to twelve hours later. This is what the pellet looks like. This is what the pellet looks like broken up. And this is what's inside the pellet. So this is a standard thing we do with third graders all the time. You know, we get all the pellets from our owl. Now, I always joke that we have an owl pellet making machine, you know, outside. And then we get these pellets, and then the kids, we, we sterilize them, don't get me wrong. And then we give them to the kids to dissect. And I'll tell you what, this is such a fun activity. The kids love it. They really do. Six to 12 hours later, they cough up a pellet. This is the undigestible parts of it. Are there other birds cough up pellets? I hope you're saying yeah, I can't hear you, but I hope you're saying yeah, because all sorts of birds do it. Kingfishers will do it, hawks do it, all sorts of birds cough up pellets. Uh, and, and that's just how it is. It's not just owls that do this. Alright? Let me just take a minute to I'm, I'm, I'm in this mood of dispelling myths and dispelling rumors and wrong notions about things. One of the ones is like you got three different sizes here, right? You have three different size owls there. And always, everybody always says that this is the runt of the litter, right? It's the runt of the litter, the small one, right? It's not the runt. These are not mammals, okay? What's happened here is that when this mom lays her egg, she lays one egg a day, okay? She lays one egg, and in the case of owls, they will sit on it and incubate it immediately after laying that egg. Then the next day, because all birds can only lay one egg a day. So then the second day she lays another egg. And then guess what? She starts eating that one. And then she may skip a day, let's just say for example. And then on the fourth day she lays a third egg. Alright? And now she's got three eggs underneath her and she's incubating. And they all incubate the same amount of time. So then what happens is the first egg hatches first on the first, on the first day that it's due. Then the next day, the next one. And then, say, two days later, the next one. So this one is not the runt of the litter. This one is four days younger than that one. 
That's the difference. Because they have asynchronous hatching. They all hatch differently. Now compare that to a robin in your yard or a chickadee. Those birds do it completely different. A robin or a blue jay or a chickadee will lay an egg and leave. And then come back the next day and lay an egg and then leave. They haven't abandoned those eggs. They know right where they're at. <laughs> they just don't want you to go on attracting attention to it. So the third day she comes back and lays another one. Fourth day, fifth day, okay, say so it's a robin and she's got five eggs. Then at the time in which she's laid all her eggs, then she sits on them. Then they all start to incubate, and then they all hatch together in a synchronous hatching, having all the chicks the same age. Now these birds will nest at what time of year? Now, January, February, March, if they lay an egg and then left for 24 hours and came back, they'd have an egg sickle. They'd be frozen solid. It wouldn't work, so they incubate it right away. So the hawks, so the eagles, so the owls, and they all produce this asynchronous hatching. All right? So, cavity nesting in some birds, like barn owls and cavities, or screech owls and wood duck foxes. And here's and then great one. No owls, by the way, building their own nest. They they bully other birds and they take it. Like just for example, here's an old hawk nest that they take over. That's another hawk nest that they take over. Some of our owls are ground nesting birds, like short eared owls, they nest on ground. And then burrowing owls nest underground. So there's underground, there's on ground, there's above ground. All sorts of different types. We talked about that, we didn't hear. Now these birds, we love them, right? But we should love them for different reasons. The barn owls here, which not a lot around here, in a 10 year lifespan, which is about average for these guys, one owl eats about 11,000 mice. And it was calculated that those 11,000 mice would eat about 13 tons of grain and crops. So these are really the farmer's friend. Having these things around is really a helpful thing for lots of this is what they do in California, Arizona. They put up these boxes for the barn owls to roost in and because uh, they want to keep them around. Uh, so they eat all these things. Uh, we talk about incubating all at the same time. This is what it produces, the small, medium, and large. And again, this one's three to four days older than that one there. These are elf owls, by the way. And this was a hairy woodpecker cavity. Hairy woodpeckers make holes about this big. These are elf owls. They are so tiny. It's just ridiculous how small they are. Um, let's see. When the baby owls are hatched, the mom broods them, meaning she sits on them for the first six to ten days. Why does she do that? Because these baby birds have no thermal regulation. They have no ability to regulate their own body temperature. So she sits on them to keep them warm. And this is where the term brooding mother comes from. All right? The oldest usually lives, the youngest one oftentimes doesn't. Learning to fly is the most difficult part of these birds' lives. They have a very hard time doing it. A lot of them die during that part. And they, they use something called branching. They come out and they sit on branches. All right? And then it's not unusual for these birds to come out of the nest and spend a day or two days on the ground. They are not abandoned. The parents will come feed them, try not to them and bring them to the rehabber because they're going to probably do one thing you could do though is maybe help them up in a tree, get them off the ground where the dogs can't get to them, that type of thing. But never usually take them away, these baby owls, because the parents are there. It's daytime when you see them usually. They're, they're not feeding during the day, they're feeding at night. So you can see them. Uh, this was at my nature center here, this owl was on the ground, so we put the owl back there and like a parrot. Learning to hunt is very difficult for these birds. It's the hardest thing that they can do. Once they figure that out, they can really get going. So, and then they start doing a great job with it. Migration and eruption. So some of these owls have regular, regular migratory uh, activities, while others have eruptive activities. Like great gray owls have eruptive. Every 5 to 10 to 15 years will erupt out of their regular territory and move into other areas. These birds 
birds have the advantage when it comes to winter time. And if you don't think that's true, look at the fact that that snow is on top of that elephant's head and it's not melting. That's how comfortable they are in the winter time. And they plunge through the snow to capture all their food. And the winter time is the advantage. It's the time of plenty for these olives, not a bad time for them. It's a good time for them. So with that, I want to say thanks for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about our lovely olive friends.
questions made for life and what? Oh, you have an alpha? Yeah. So, so we're hitting on two really great topics here. Uh, the made for life thing is, uh, this is such a hard topic to talk about, um, but uh, in, in the natural world, there are no made for life. That's a human construct made by humans for humans and has no place in the natural world. Okay? The fidelity is to the nest site. Now, a lot, some birds will have good fidelity to each other and they will form long pair, long term pair bonds. So, when you look at a lot of these birds, they don't have a year round pair bond. They have just their mating season. If you wanted to find a pair, if you wanted to find some birds that most closely relate to what people do, meaning they stay together as a family unit for long periods of time, we have to look at the cranes. So Sandhill cranes, they did a very nice study with this over a 15-year period of time. 75% of all the participants they had in the study stayed together with the same pair, with their same mate over 15 years. So that's not bad. 25% broke up, you know, grass was greener, whatever, one of them died. Whatever, you know, like that. More so with the cranes, the adults and their kids at the end of the nesting season will migrate as a family unit south, spend the winters together, and then migrate back up as the family unit. You cannot say that about bald eagles, swans, geese, whatever, name the species, because usually they separate. Take osprey, for example, that's a great one, where uh, the nest fidelity is really what keeps them together, and they find each other in the springtime at the nest. So then, in the fall, the female goes her way, the male goes her his way, and they're together for, you know, five months, maybe. That means they're spending at least seven months apart. Now, I don't like you, but I think just about anybody. Yeah. 